Let me, let me start with a confession. Uh, you're not the first person to have me at a TED Talk in, in Saigon, but it's the, it's the first one I've, I've spoken at. Um, when we first arrived in Saigon, uh, the University of Economics in Ho Chi Minh City was holding their TED Talk, and I was there supporting a colleague and a friend of mine um, with, with her work and helping her with her presentation. And, um, the, the topic of the event was Millennials, the trigger of everything. So if those aren't sure, millennials are people born between the early 80s and somewhere in the mid-90s. And um, I, I think officially anyone that's still a student at BIS can't be a millennial. You're now, you're now the next one. You had to be born in 99 or something like that. So here I am, fresh in the country. I'm a millennial. Wow, am I, am I the trigger of everything? And the, the whole point was that this generation of young people, kind of from university graduates on to kind of early career professionals, is one day going to take over the world from um, the generation before us, and, and how are we going to change it, and how is it going to be better? And as an economist, I was very excited uh, to get to the University of Economics in the biggest city uh, in, in the country and try and meet some economic students. These are the millennials. They want to be the trigger of everything. They study my discipline. I would really have liked to find some economists to work with, A, fluent in Vietnamese, B, know their country really well, for me to work with them, maybe hire them one point in the future, uh, empl employ them to help me do consultancy work and studies. Um, I thought, this is going to be my gateway into the, into the country and into my, my new life working in Vietnam. I was a bit disappointed. In all the breaks, I went around, asked all these economic students what they wanted to be when they graduated, and they said, marketing. Every single one of them said, I want to go into marketing. I'd engage a nice, bright, young-looking student in a conversation over a cup of tea or a uh, kind of gelatinous pudding, and uh, they said they were going to marketing, and I would swiftly try and end it and move on to someone else, and after a while, I got a bit dispirited, and everyone just wanted to do marketing, and no one wanted to use their economic skills to take on what I thought were the really big challenges in the world. What's marketing? This is marketing. It's selling people things, mobile phones. So I'm going to try and convince some of you today, if you end up in economics or business or political science, please don't spend your life designing billboards. I want you to take on the big challenges facing the world, facing your countries, and uh, try and design and create transformations that are a bit more about selling phones and taking selfies and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to talk about agriculture. And here in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, you might feel a bit, uh, what's, that, what's agriculture got to do with anything? Um, the farmers of the world are like the people Pedro talked about earlier. They're a bit forgotten. You don't find them in shopping malls and uh, in cinemas in, in Saigon. But agriculture is vitally important to Vietnam's history and to its current economy. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a picture of, of Vietnam's exports. Exports are a nice way of thinking about what is a country really, really, really good at. Uh, you don't really need to see the numbers, but this yellow box up here is kind of any is vegetable products. You can see a dark red in the right-hand corner, which is timber and wood products. Um, so, some of the other more natural, you can see some green foodstuffs, animal hides, that kind of stuff. And that might be a bit meaningless. There are, there are much bigger, bigger circles, more sexy things like machines. Maybe mobile phones that take selfies, they go under machines. Um, but I'm going to compare it quickly to South Korea. Now, apart from North Korea, everyone loves South Korea. They're a really good example of a country that has transformed themselves massively. In the mid-70s, they were in a similar economic situation after their war to Vietnam, and now they're a poster child for kind of good economic leadership and uh, you know, relatively uh, equal and equitable um, development. And you'll notice here you can't really see these natural colors. Again, machines, pretty high transportation. They make lots of trains and stuff. And these natural-looking colors are much, much smaller. So compared to countries that it wants to aspire to be like, uh, agriculture and, and natural resources are a very, very big part of Vietnam's uh, economy. Now, this is, uh, this is Cambodia. I, I don't think Vietnam has much aspiration to uh, turn into Cambodia anytime soon. And again, you can see my vegetable products and foodstuffs are much, much higher. I'm going to think about this another way. We're going to think about 
outside of the city, how many people are involved in and make their livelihoods from agriculture. Of course, some of these big industries make a lot of money. They're very high worth. But um, over this is, this is a graph of employment in, in Vietnam. Obviously, it's declined. You can see that downward slope has declined a lot in the last 30 years. But at the moment, we still have 40% of people in employment in Vietnam working in agriculture. So I'm going to ask a few questions. How many people in Vietnam, roughly? Someone, sh shout me with some numbers. Are we happy with 96? Yeah, roughly. OK, I'll take no uh, let's take 90. It's an easier number to do mental arithmetic with. Uh, let's make a guess. I don't know the answer. Uh, how many people do we think have a job in Vietnam? So take into account retired people and people still at school. Roughly? 50%. I'll take that. That's nice. Ish. OK, so we've gone from 90, 50% working, 45 million people, 40% of which work in agriculture. Uh, so divide it by 10, 4.5 times it by 4. 18 million people working in agriculture in Vietnam. That's a serious amount of people. Um, especially if you take into account 10 million people in Saigon, nearly 10 million in Hanoi, Haiphong, Da Nang. If you walk into the countryside, almost every other person you meet is going to be working in agriculture. I've added in a line, I drew this one by hand. Uh, I've added in a line, this is the rest of the world, and I couldn't fit South Korea on the graph because it's currently at about 4%. So, uh, kind of here ish. So, Vietnam's economy, despite the fact it's one of the fastest growing economies in the world, increasingly modern, transformed a lot in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, is still very, very heavily dependent on agriculture. And for a lot of the people in the country, uh, those that um, can't afford to send their children to PIS, they are absolutely dependent on agriculture. So I'm going to put that into context of a few uh, sectors, a few agricultural sectors in Vietnam, and we'll talk about specifically why there needs to be a transformation. Uh, these are rice fields. Vietnam is famous for rice. It's called the rice bowl of the world. It's one of the largest producers. I think it now is the largest producer because Thailand's been having some... Uh, problems recently with democracy and exporting its, uh, its produce. Um, but despite being one of the largest, if not the largest, rice producer in the world, not everyone wants Vietnam's rice, and they sometimes have a really hard time selling it. The Vietnamese themselves prefer Thai rice. They pay more for it. Um, they buy more of it, especially at special occasions. They can uh, turn uh, Thai rice into stickier types of rice. Um, not gum tan, but uh, you know, yeah, it's kind of sti sticky, sticky rice for special occasions. Um, Vietnamese rice sometimes gets sent back to Vietnam because it's too full of things that it shouldn't be full of. Rice, pretty simple, should just be made up of rice, but sometimes shipments get to the US laced with pesticides and other things that shouldn't be there. And certainly food safety and the quality of food produce has hit Vietnam, Vietnam's own headlines recently. So very bad to have pesticides still in your rice when it gets to someone's uh, steamer. steamer. Um, the country is trying to understand how it can produce higher quality rice and boost export revenues at the moment. So um, this is a kind of tr a transition that the country's on, and I'll come, I'll come back a bit later as to why the current method of production is not very good. Next, I'm going to talk about timber. This is a photo I took in Tansan Yat Airport after my Tet holiday. You might not be able to read the details, but it's for a furniture show somewhere in a conference center in, uh, in the city. Very strange. I've been to a few airports. You don't normally see posters in airports for outdoor furniture shows. But believe it or not, Vietnam is one of the uh, biggest exporters of garden furniture in the world. All the people, those of you from Europe with nice kind of outdoor tables and chairs in your gardens back home in Europe, you probably never sit on it because it's always too cold, and you probably wish you had it with you in Saigon. Anyway, it was probably put together here in Vietnam. But the trees don't come from Vietnam. None of the timber in Vietnam is of good enough quality to be turned into things like furniture. This grand piano, the wood, is incredibly hard to find, very difficult to make, requires a lot of high craftsmanship and very well-educated farmers. The timber on this stage that we're walking on, also high-quality timber. Even this TEDx sign, which was probably made, by, in, made from cheap plywood by someone in the DT department. Most Vietnamese timber is not good enough quality to turn into plywood. Instead, it gets shipped off to China and Indonesia to be turned into toilet paper. 
Instead, Vietnam's furniture industry is supplied by timber from countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and China. So they're exporting billions of dollars a year of uh, furniture, flat-packed, um, but all the Vietnamese are doing is drilling the holes and making the space where the Allen key is going to go when you get it and open it up in Europe or America. Why, why is that a problem? Well, if anyone's got uh, engaged or married, they might know that diamonds are quite expensive. But big diamonds are even more expensive. The bigger a diamond, it gets exponentially more expensive than a small diamond. And timber's kind of the same. The, the timber that's made this floor is maybe one or two inches wide, but the skills required to grow a tree to make planks of timber even only one or two inches wide is kind of very high compared to the mess you can make if you're just going to chop it down, stick it through a blitzer, and turn it into toilet paper. So big transformation needed if we're going to get more value, think of those big diamonds, very high value, more value out of timber. My third one is coffee. I went into Starbucks on Taudine. I think you probably all know who that is. Uh, often the SUVs clogging up the traffic during the rush hour. I took some photos of the coffee they sell. Uh, this one in the middle, this is the one that they also use uh, in their machines. It's from Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is their spring season blend. Looks nice. It's got a combination of uh, coffee from Guatemala, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea too. And on the left, this is their uh, single origin special from Guatemala. Now, they were selling some Vietnamese coffee. You couldn't get it in a drink there and then. You could buy it in a bag. Uh, they're Dalat. Now, the th key thing I'm going to circle here, uh, small lot coffee, very limited edition, not very many bags of it, only sold here in, in Starbucks's Vietnam outlets. So this is a really uh, good example where most, most Vietnamese coffee gets turned into three in one, not very high quality, produced en masse. Um, it's very, very hard to find uh, in global markets good quality Vietnamese coffee. And coffee producers in Indonesia, in Papua New Guinea, in Colombia and Guatemala getting much higher prices for their coffee from their coffee farms for their effort than producers are in Vietnam. What I've just said isn't, isn't heresy and it's not going to get me in trouble. In fact, it's this desire to transition into a new way of doing agriculture in Vietnam. It's actually government policy. This is a meeting I was at just before Tet with the Vietnamese government and the Vietnamese Business Association and the Dutch government. And the Dutch Minister for Trade and Export was here and the uh, Vice President of some exporting department of the Ministry of Agriculture standing on the stage and saying, Vietnam's policy is value, not volume. So this is great. Everyone's heading in the same direction. Um, and it's not just important for farmers, and it's not just important for Vietnam's economy. When we talk about rice production, Vietnam has got famous because in the Mekong Delta, they can get three crops out a year. They had the luxury of the Mekong River producing, of giving them as much water as they needed. But as the countries upstream start to dam the Mekong, China, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, taking their hydroelectric energy, the water flows are getting lower, and it can no longer just rely on its wasteful use of water. If we think about coffee, a lot of deforestation has happened in this country where people have chopped down kind of prestigious uh, and primary rainforest um, in order to grow coffee on otherwise pretty rubbish land, and they're now producing rubbish coffee and not getting much money for it. Same with timber. When you grow timber for only four or five years, chop it down, turn it into toilet paper, every time you clear the land, uh, given the amount of rain in Vietnam, soil washes away, it um, causes lots of problems downstream, and it eventually just simply erodes the soil on the land, and after a few harvests, there's absolutely nothing left. And the longer you grow your timber for, the more um, the kind of ecology of the soil and the root structure is strengthened, and uh, you, you know, disrupting it less and less. So there are kind of real global reasons and kind of local environmental and social reasons why moving to a value-driven economy and not a volume-driven economy is really, really beneficial for this country. So how are we going to make this transformation? We can't just wait and stumble across something. There's, what was that number? 18 million farmers in this country. You know, we need to change their behavior. So how do we go about doing that? So uh, yeah, and, and, th and this is what I study, and this is what we do. Um, you can start at the top. 
For some, re for some reason, it's actually tax-free to export really low-quality wood to, to other countries to be turned into toilet paper. It's an enormous tax on high-quality wood. We can also look at the bottom, literally. Some of the work we do with shrimp farmers in the Mekong region, they can get higher prices for their shrimp if they can prove that they've installed a modern hygienic toilet and that raw sewage is not getting into the ponds where they grow their shrimp. There's all sorts of things you can do in the middle. Anna, before the interval, she said the, she had this lovely quote about transformation being about unlearning. And these 18 million farmers have got generations and generations of mothers and fathers who have taught them how to farm based on economic conditions, social conditions, um, before Vietnam's current transition. So we have to teach them new skills about farming. We also, if we're going to get them to make something different, high quality coffee, not low quality coffee, or uh, timber good enough for a grand piano, not timber good enough for toilet paper, we need to connect them with those people that want to buy those things. They just might sell to the same person every year, the person their father sold to, the person their grandmother sold to, the person their family sold to 100 years ago. We need to connect them to new businesses that want higher value products that are gonna pay them more for what they do. Um, so I hope with those few examples, um, I've kind of shown you how you can go about, how, how we, why we need to go about an agricultural transformation in this country, why it's good for local people, a vast, vast um, kind of number of people in this country will have uh, better kind of social and economic conditions as a result. Um, really important for the global environmental conditions, and I hope I've inspired a few of you to uh, make some transformations uh, in this country that are more than just about selfies and mobile phones. Thank you very much. Thank you.